Hey everyone, welcome back. Today we're taking a look at the proposed Vancouver streetcar system. This is going to be a video about how the region plans for future projects, but after walking along the route, filming, and going down the rabbit hole on past streetcar studies, here we are. We will start off with the history of this project, a look at the routes, why it's a good idea, and why it hasn't happened yet. Vancouver City Council got serious about a streetcar network in the early 1990s. Several reports looked at the viability, returned favorable results, and led the city to start preserving rail corridors and right of ways for the future project. In 1996, the CP rail corridor that runs from Granville Island to Camby Street was purchased by the city for $9 million. That led to the start of the Heritage Streetcar that ran between Main Street Science World and Granville Island from 1998 till 2011. But the old station outside of Science World is still there, complete with rails, platforms, and cool railings. That line was much more of a tourist route rather than an actual transit service, especially since it only ran from May till mid-October. Then, in a 1999 report, over 30 routes were considered for streetcars, but only three of those routes would achieve 100% cost recovery. Those three routes were explored in detail in a 2005 release streetcar study, which determined yet again that the system for downtown and False Creek region would be viable. The 2005 study proposed a zero phase from Main Street Station to Granville Island along the existing route that the Heritage Streetcar ran, with the option to expand northwest into downtown in a future phase. The phased approach would keep costs down, only costing $60 million including a startup maintenance facility. The full route from Granville Island to Waterfront through Gastown would only cost $102 million in 2005. The reason it didn't go ahead? Well, TransLink and the city didn't want to compete for the limited funding that was available at the time. It was agreed that what funds were around would be better used in other projects that would serve the region as a whole. At the time, the Canada Line had also just been approved, so the optics of another major Vancouver project wouldn't have been great. But that didn't stop the city. Over the next 13 years, city planners continued to make sure the right-of-way was maintained, and any new roadworks, utilities construction, or new buildings all kept the plan in mind. For the 2010 Winter Olympics, a temporary service called the Olympic Line was put into service for two months running between the Canada Line Olympic Village Station and Granville Island. The city and Bombardier in partnership spent $8.5 million to upgrade their right-of-way with new track and overhead wire to allow for two Bombardier Flexity streetcars to run for two months. The trains were borrowed from Brussels and ran from January 21st to March 21st. The free service saw over 550,000 passengers in the two months of operations, and gave Vancouverites a taste of what the future could be. Then, after a showdown between CP Rail and the city, the Arbutus Corridor was purchased in 2016 for $55 million, securing another major right-of-way for a future streetcar. The streetcar and the Arbutus Greenway report gives us an idea of what a line would look like, including a map and street layout drawings on the route that would connect via Marple to Marine Drive Station on the Canada Line. There's been talk about another possible extension continuing along to newest Minster, but that's outside of the scope of this video. In the 2018 Streetcar Feasibility Study, which was made public via a Freedom of Information request in 2020, is where things get interesting. Building on the 2005 report, the 2018 report gives us an updated route map, ridership numbers, and a lot more insight into the plan. In the new plan, it's been recommended that each phase is larger, but fewer phases overall. The first phase includes almost the entirety of Line 1, running from Waterfront all the way to the Arbutus Skytrain Station, which is scheduled to open sometime early in 2026. I've got a video series following its construction, link in the description if you haven't already seen that. Heading north from Arbutus Station, the line follows the existing former CP right-of-way as it curves and descends to False Creek. While the old rails are gone, you can still see crossings and rail infrastructure in place along the route. All along the Arbutus Corridor, new pedestrian and cycling infrastructure will be included in the final build-out. Line 1 then heads north, running down 1st Street to West 2nd, where it turns east towards Granville Island. But before we get there, this is where a very short line is planned to run to the massive new Sinoak development at the base of the Burrard Street Bridge. With up to 6,000 new homes expected to be completed by 2030, the new development has provisions for a streetcar station on site to help move the 9,000 plus residents around the area and to other major transit connections. It wasn't included in the 2018 report since the project was years away from starting, but we'll just consider it to be included from this point forward in Phase 1. Back at Granville Island, there are a few options to reach the station, but one does involve removal of the building at 1500 West 2nd Avenue, formerly a Starbucks, but now a local cafe. Following the old tracks across the street takes us to the station proper, which was updated to modern standards for the 2010 Olympics. 
Depending on which route option is chosen through this area, the station will have to be modified or completely rebuilt. Heading east along the corridor, all major infrastructure is designed for double track alignment. It even comes with pre-installed artwork by locals of various skill levels. Continuing along, we pass by the short double track section where the Olympic streetcars pass each other, and then under the Laurel Street land bridge. Just before arriving at Olympic Village Station, we pass one of the old historic streetcar sheds. This one has been proposed as a possible maintenance facility if a short line was operated on the short 1.8 km section. And at the station proper, we find another modern platform standing empty. This one's a little less overgrown. This could become a major connection point in the future between lines. Next, we head under the south end of the Canby Street Bridge to West 1st Avenue, where the wide, empty medians are waiting for streetcar tracks to return. All along West 1st Ave, it's clear what the plan is. This all dates back to the 1990s when the city made the effort to have the area prepared for a future streetcar, saving millions of dollars in the process. You can see some more relics from the line that used to run along here, but were ripped out when the Olympic Village neighborhood was built in the late aughts. If you head over to Google Earth and go back to 2007, you can see the old line running along the north side of 1st Avenue. Once we reach Quebec Street, the line turns north, and again you can see the width. As the line passes Main Street Station, we once again see the old Heritage Station, run down but not forgotten. Both Line 1 and 2 share this section, but Line 2 splits off at Pacific Boulevard. Line 1 continues north to Columbia, then splits into two single tracks running along both West Cordova Street and both Powell and Water Streets, before rejoining just east of Waterfront Station. That makes up Phase 1, but there are also provisions to extend west along Cordova, and then south on Butte, west along Hastings, and then joining West Georgia at Cadero Street before terminating just outside of Stanley Park at Chilco Street. This drawing shows it pretty well. Links to these maps will also be in the description below, as the entire route has been mapped like this. The total distance of Line 1 is 8.8 kilometers and carries a cost of roughly $500 million. It would see between 12.8 and 18.8 million boardings per year by 2050. Keep in mind, these numbers are based on a data set from 2016. Naturally, it's expected to be higher now with increased population and transit user base. On the other hand, Line 2 is shorter, starting at Great Northern Way Emily Car Station. It would head west along East 1st Ave, run in conjunction with the other line along Quebec Street, before heading west again along Pacific Boulevard. The exact route through this area isn't available yet since the viaducts are expected to be removed later this decade, which will change the road network in the area. But that also means more commercial and residential buildings will go up, once again increasing the potential ridership. Line 2 will service both stadiums and then continue along Pacific Boulevard under the north end of the Canby Street Bridge. It will then provide another connection to the Canada Line at Yale Town Roundhouse, with the streetcar station just steps away from the current station entrance. Then it'll turn up Drake Street, where it will terminate at Granville Street. The incline up Drake Street is within the limit of what a modern streetcar can safely traverse. Line 2 will be about 3.6 kilometers long and would see between 3.6 and 5.2 million boardings annually by 2050, again based on the same 2016 ridership projections. Now, unfortunately costs have gone up. The full 12 kilometer network would cost at least $1.3 billion in 2023. The high ridership strength of the network is driven by several key factors. First off, the amount of connectivity to the rest of the transit network is immense, with four Expo Line stations, two Millennium Line stations, three Canada Line stations, West Coast Express, C-Bus, Helijet, and Harbor Air. Plus, a connection to the R5 Rapid Bus on Hastings and Gastown, which will likely be upgraded to a SkyTrain line in the future. It also connects many of Vancouver's most popular tourist destinations, including Science World, Gastown, Yale Town, Stanley Park, Granville Island, and Kitsilano. Secondly, the way people interact with the streetcar network varies from other forms of rapid transit. Stations are placed much closer together at between 400 and 800 meters apart, compared to SkyTrain, BRT, and LRT systems, which are usually closer to one kilometer on average. The short distance between stations encourages riders to use the system more often, with 32% of projected trips to be under 800 meters long. In a way, streetcars are the missing middle of our transit system, bridging the service gap between buses and SkyTrain. 
It's also worth noting that a large portion of Line 1 and part of Line 2 fall into the Broadway plan for redevelopment, which will massively increase the number of residents and workers in the area. The South Falls Creek area will also be undergoing major changes as the land is owned by the city and the 60-year leases will start to run out in 2036, again providing the opportunity to develop and increase density in a smart way. The streetcar will give current and future residents of the downtown and Falls Creek areas more options for sustainable transportation. Not only does it give you the option of living car-free or car-light, but also helps the city with their climate goals and reducing traffic fatalities by having safer streets and fewer cars. Now, I can hear you asking. Why not just use buses? They would work without spending a billion dollars on a new major project. Well, you're not wrong. You could continue to serve the area with buses, but there are several advantages to streetcars over buses. First though, while the average travel speed of a streetcar compared to a bus is only a few kilometers per hour higher, it's the increased throughput of passengers that's the real advantage. Plus, you require fewer operators, run on electricity compared to diesel or compressed natural gas, they're quieter, smoother, and generally a more pleasant experience. With this proposed streetcar system looking like a great idea from multiple angles, why don't we have this already? Well, it all comes back to the same reason as before. The plan makes sense, but with a serious lack of funding for transit in the region, every dollar needs to be spent in a way that has the largest positive impact for riders. And a streetcar system in Vancouver is not that at this point in time. For example, a similar amount of funding would provide Surrey with a second SkyTrain expansion down King George Boulevard to Newton, which would greatly help the underserved region. With Surrey on pace to become the largest city in BC in the very near future, it'll need major transit investments to prevent it from becoming a gridlocked, car-dependent city. But that doesn't mean all hope is lost for the Vancouver streetcar. The 2018 report came with a set of recommendations including working on a strategic business case to advance the project, explore options for private-public partnerships, and see what the recently created Canadian Infrastructure Bank can do. Anyways, I hope you've enjoyed this gander into what Vancouver could have for our streetcar network. I'll be back with more construction content in the very near future. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.